taking down notes for week number one of Summer Sessions. The title of this weekend's sermon is Don't Fake Your Faith. Don't Fake Your Faith. Ooh, let's pray. Father, I pray that if any of us are just going through the motions and we haven't really leaned into a relationship with you, God, I pray that today would be a wake-up call of who we are, whose we are, and the call of God that's on our lives. I pray, God, that you give us ears to hear you, a mind to understand, and a heart ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Don't fake your faith. There are three ways that we can approach and live life. Number one, you're either sinking, you're either surviving, or you're thriving. I'll say it again, you're either sinking, you're either surviving or you're thriving. And in the midst of all the noise, everything that's been going on around us, I still believe, and this is audacious faith speaking, I still believe as a church and a church family, we're in a thriving season. Come on, how many of y'all believe that? That we can get to the end of this year and look back and say, yeah, 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 I wasn't sinking, maybe for a minute. I wasn't just surviving because I know who I am in Christ. No, 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 I'm actually Thriving, And I believe the thriving season is where God wants to unlock greater assignments, unlock our calling at a whole nother level. Come on, somebody say at a whole nother level. Come on. So as the hands and feet of Jesus, people who woke up again today, there is a responsibility and an opportunity. I love that. Responsibility, because we're his kids, but it's an opportunity to get our yes out of the way and fulfill the heartbeat of heaven here on earth. Because we are all called, and this is a very churchy line, if you're raised in the churchy church, this line may be a little overwhelming for you, but we're gonna unpack it and break it down a little bit this weekend. We are all called to the Great Commission. Yeah. We're like, ooh, my Lord, that's very, the Great Commission. It's like a Billy Graham conference right here. <laughs> the Great Commission, to simply, this is what it means, let me break it down, to simply get in the way of people's storms and point into Jesus. Romans chapter two, verse four says, it's the goodness and love of God that draws a man's heart to a place of freedom. We're all called to the Great Commission. There are people that you know, people that you will meet, people that you will encounter that I'll never get to. And statistically, it says that people will read your life more than they'll read the Bible. They may never step foot in a church. You may be watching online right now, you stumbled upon this on Facebook. This was a suggested play on YouTube. And you're like, I'm not going to church, but I'm intrigued by this man's beard. It's okay, thanks for watching. Now here's the truth. Every single one of us have a call and a purpose and we're all called to get in the way of people's storms and tell our story of the night and day difference that God has made in us. And at times, I've, I've preached this before, at times we just kind of go through the motions and we work a job because we get a paycheck and that's our mission. But what if your job is actually your mission field? What if your mission field are the people that you're called to every day that you're involved in life with every day. Your family, that's a great mission field. Your, your neighbors, some of you are like, you don't know my neighbor? <laughs> your neighbors, your job, your coworkers, and the community that God has connected you to. They say statistically that you have influence over two to three people. Like, like you may have thousands of Facebook friends and a bunch of Instagram friends. Those aren't real friends, by the way. Some of you bought those friends. They're bots. They're not even real. Okay, <laughs> coming in hot. Okay, it's summer sessions. No, no, watch this though. They say statistically you only have trust equity with about three people. So maybe those three people are your mission field because what if one of those three, what if when you speak life into that person and their marriage is restored, the domino effect is it affects their kids. And what if one of their children is one of the next great evangelists and revivalists to reach the world? What if your yes and your surrender affects the next generation? This is what the word says. And this is, this is for all of us. None of us are exempt from this verse. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Now again, I love this because it's a directive. It's not a suggestion but it's actually a command from the Lord. It says this, and then he told them, go. I'll shout that. Go into all of the world and preach the good news to people that you kind of get along with. <laughs> preach the good news to people that understand your political views. Preach the good news to those who 
uh, like the same music as you. Preach the good news to those who look just like you or have the same economic status as you. It doesn't say that. It says, and then he told them to go into all of the world, all of the world, and preach the good news to everybody. Come on, say everybody. Come on, everybody. Again, it's a directive. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Don't stay stuck. Don't compartmentalize and, well, when is it going to be my chance to step up and step in. All he's looking for is surrender. All he's looking for is your yes. All he's looking for is a willing vessel to go. Go into all of the world. That's your mission field. Some of y'all are like, but you lost me with the whole going to the all, all the world. Like, I'm never going overseas. That is not for me. I'll, I'll send people out. Lord, bless me to send them, but I'm like, but your neighbor is actually your Uganda. Your coworkers are actually that mission trip that you were called to go on because the Lord's saying, hey, if you won't impact who's around you, you'll never impact anybody else. And your yes could cost, oh man, I'm, I'm telling you, your, your yes could open up a, a, a door of supernatural favor and open up doors that God wants to open, but he's just waiting on, he, on you because I've said this for years, he's not a forcer. He will not force you to move. He will not force you to go. He gave us the directive. Our part is to simply be obedient and follow through. Elbow the person next to you and say, you better go. But not till after the message. Like, please don't apply it immediately. Stay where you're at. Okay. So number one, because this is a command, it's a directive. Number one, we have to go with the good news. Come on, write that down. It's on the screens. We have to go with the good news. The gospel literally means good news. It's really, really great news because it's filled with hope, it's filled with joy and strength and faith. It's filled with perseverance. It's filled with courage and diligence. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And a lot of you know my testimony, but the lady who walked up to my mom in the cereal aisle of a Kroger in the middle of nowhere, Ohio, she, you know what she did when she woke up that morning at 73 years old? She, she got up and she said, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go and I've got my, I've got my to-do list. I've got to get eggs, I've got to get milk, I've got to get those cookies that you just kind of cut, you know, this, it's like in a sausage roll and you cut them and just throw them on a pan. I've got to get, these are my list, i got to get, but in the midst of her agenda, God disrupted her plans because she was willing to go and she got in the way of my mom, my brother, my sister, and my little husky self. She got in the way of our storm and y'all, it changed the entire trajectory of our family. Why? Because she was carrying the good news. Yeah. Yeah. If you have the good news, why would you hide it? If you have the really good news, why would you say, no, <laughs> keep this to me? Because, you know, in our society, we love to hoard. We're holy hoarders. Just kind of keep all the good news to us. But what if that good news, according to the Bible, is supposed to be heard by the world? And he's looking for you. Come on, look at the person next to you and say, he's looking for you. He's looking for you. Now, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, there are still people's lives attached to your purpose. And the enemy knows this. I've preached this for years. He knows if he can rip you off and rob you of your joy and your confidence, he not only rips you off, but rips all the people off connected to your assignment. And he knows if I can just disrupt her go, she won't reach the people that she is called to reach as a willing vessel. That's why it's so important. And the sooner we recognize that we are all called to go, to get out of our comfort zone, to introduce people to this miracle working God who can change everything in a moment, we will begin to see greater things happen in our own lives and others. So part of go is you have to pivot. Part of go is you have to move on purpose. You have to move on purpose in order to go. I've said this for a while. I, I, you know your boy likes acronyms. So go is simple. You're like, what's he gonna say? This is, it's just two letters. Go, get out. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone and serve your community. Get out and serve on Days of Hope that's happening this entire month here at Hope City. Y'all, our mission team, give it up for our mission team. I'm telling you, Pastor Brandon, Pastor Kristen, Anthony and Michelle, Vic, the whole squad. I'm telling you, we have so many serve initiatives and projects that you can be involved in, but you got to get out of your comfort zone. Well, it's a whole lot easier to sit back and just watch Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus. 
just give a little extra in the bucket. Or you could get up, put your Crocs on, <laughs> pray, show up and serve. Get out of the flesh and walk in the spirit. Come on, somebody shout out loud. Let's go. Come on. So think about this. When you, when you go out of town, because a lot of you, maybe you already went on vacation, maybe you're about to go on vacation. When you go out of town, does your giving and generosity stop? Why? Because the gospel, the good news, continues on. When, when you go out of town on vacation, does your moral compass change directions? Like, you know, what happens on vacation stays on vacation. No, 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 no. You're still a king's kid. Are you still living by the holiness and righteousness and the standard of a king's kid? I'm telling you, this isn't about legalism. It's about a righteous indignation. When you're going... Your faithfulness and your commitment to God and the call on your life and the hope that he's entrusted us to share, it has to come with us. If I'm in Destin, my go is still active. If I'm in St. Louis, my go is still active. If we're on a road trip as a family and we're in San Marcos or Wimberley, there's a lot of wind in that. Wimberley, wherever we're at, we can be, we preached this for a long time. I pray that you grab this. You can be a Thermometer that just tells the temperature? Or because of your go, when you walk into a room, you're a thermostat that changes, changes the atmosphere. See, when I walk into a room, I walk in with a boldness and a confidence of who I am and who I am. Because I know that God is speaking in and through me and every opportunity, any opportunity that I have to speak life into somebody or tell my story or talk about Jesus. I can't help it. My kids know, oh man, dad's talking. He's gonna tell them about Jesus. He's gonna tell them how he went from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted, from being born into a chaotic, addiction-filled family to watching God show up and take everything that was falling apart and cause it to fall into place. Come on, our go doesn't stop. Come on, look at the person next to you and say, I think he's talking to you. Come on, I think he's talking to you. Because you know when you get out of your comfort zone, and you begin to pursue the things of God, your character and integrity will speak volumes to people who don't walk with the Lord. The residue of your relationship with Jesus will speak for itself. And God's not looking for perfect people. That is a pressure and a high maintenance life that we can't ever live up to. He's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for purposed people. People that wake up every day and say, I have a call on my life. Now, I do this to pay my bills, but I've got a call on my life to get in the way of somebody's storm today and tell them about my Savior, how his blood still works, how the healing power of God is still alive and active today, and the same power that conquered the grave lives in me, so I'm gonna tell some people about it. Yeah, yeah, but, but maybe you're watching. This is the number one question that we get whenever I preach about this moment. Yeah, I get it, Daniel, this is awesome, but you don't understand my past. You don't understand what I've been through, you don't understand what I, I've messed up in, you don't understand the compartmentalized pain that if anybody found out the real me, I would be ashamed. I've got great news, your past was an education, not a destination. God has things that he wants to unlock and do through you, and this is where the enemy loves, he loves to try to make you feel that you're the only one that's ever dealt with any of this. It's wild when you start telling your story and you start Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpening iron, when you join a group, when you start serving with others, you'll be like, whoa, whoa, wait, what? You been through that? I've been through that. You got set free from that during the freedom encounter because you went through a freedom group? That's amazing because I, I, I used to deal with that. Wait a minute, you, you used to vape with the Captain Crunch flavor? I don't even know if that's real. It's, it's ridiculous. I don't have to do that anymore. Whatever it is, whatever your story is, I don't know your life. Okay. The good news is this. Because we in our humanity, we disconnect very quickly because we're like, well, here's the truth. I'm not qualified. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. From the moment of conception, he's faithful to complete the work he started in you. When he knit you together in your mama's womb, he knew every minute, hour, 
day, week, year, the steps she would take on this planet and said, I see her, I know her by name. I'm proud of him. Me, born in the natural, an accident. Thank God my mom didn't follow through when she had an opportunity two times over to follow through to abort me. Some of you are like, what happened? Well, I made it. I'm not a hologram. Like, I'm here. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I'm right here. But I'm grateful. I'm grateful that my mom said there must be a purpose behind this baby's life. I'm not sure I believe the hype that this baby's an accident. I'm grateful that my mom chose to keep me. None of you are on this planet breathing by chance or accident. God has an incredible plan and purpose and he will qualify the called. Again, there's people's lives connected to your purpose. Romans chapter 10, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible and it's pretty sobering and I'm gonna read a little slow because I need you to grab this. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, it says this, but how can they call on him, they're talking about Jesus, to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is the go part. This is why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. And some of you are like, well, that verse didn't apply to me. You have no idea how ugly my feet are. They call me Hammer Toes Henry, amen. All right, when you tell your story and you tell people how you went from rejected to accepted, from nothing to something, the night and day difference God made in you, it can be an absolute game changer in someone else's life. So here's what I'm challenging you with week one of summer sessions. Be stronger than your strongest excuse. I love this quote. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. I, I'm, a, I'm a shoe guy. I'm a sneakerhead. And I went in Florida to this, uh, this kind of underground. Uh, it was almost a scavenger hunt to even find this sneaker shop. They're like, it's over here. And it wasn't. They're like, ha, 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 it's over there. And it was like, okay. So I end up finding it. I walk in. It's like super like top secret feeling. There's no prices on anything. There's a guy in the corner like just lacing up shoes and other people just putting shoes on the wall looking at you like, how'd you hear about us? Like it's real. I'm not sure it was legal, but it was amazing. And so I'm in there. And I'm like, how much for these shoes? And he's like, for you, $300. I'm like, okay. How, about, how much are these shoes? He said, for you, $285. And I went back to the other ones. How much for these? For you, $280. I'm like, cool, I dropped $20 just <laughs> tricking him. <laughs> I realized very quickly, I was going to check out shoes. I was going because I heard about the reputation of how elite and exclusive they had of unique shoes. And I realized very quickly, whoa, Lord, you sent me here on an assignment. I ended up sitting next to this guy, and I said, man, how'd you get started? And he said, well, you know, we kind of have this low-key thing. You know, we, we, they hook up NBA players and celebrities and all this stuff. And he's like, I don't have any prices on anything. And, you know, I set up shop for like a month in a location, and then we move. And, and he's telling me all about it. And I said, that's great. That's incredible. This is your business. And tell me about your life. And in about 15 minutes, this guy begins to unpack how his dad ran out on him in nine and how all his friends made fun of him because he never had anything and he would wear shoes that were knockoffs or looked like something that they weren't and kids would make fun of him and say, well, if you blink really fast, they look like Jordans and he'd be like, man, these are Reeboks. Like, and he struggled with insecurity, struggled with all these things and getting bullied and then he started bullying people and so in a matter of a few moments, I went in to check out shoes but within a 30 minute window, I'm actually put my hands on this guy's shoulder saying, let me pray with you, let me pray for you. Because here's the truth. You don't have to be an expert of the origin of the dirt on someone to help them rinse it off. And I stood there in this moment and I went there to look at shoes, but God very quickly, because of my relationship with the Lord, nudged my heart. I did not send you here for you. I sent you here for him. You know, every year when I go back to Florida, I go back to this same spot. He remembers me, he calls me Rev. What's up, Rev? I'm like, what's going on? I was like, still no discount. <laughs> what's the deal? <laughs> Prayed for you and he haven't helped me or hooked me up at all. All right, this is what the Bible says. Matthew chapter five, verses 13 through 16. I love this verse. 
You're the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, and trampled underfoot. It's pretty intense. Verse 14, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp, put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Y'all, this second half, the light part, we get it. We're like, yes, light of the world, I get it. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, that's pretty good. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Awesome, we get that part. What's he talking about with the saltiness? Salt? <laughs> like You're like, is that the same as sassy? Because my mother-in-law, she would be. S- salt, what is he talking about? What salt is, watch this, salt is distinctive. We were never called to blend in. The light part makes sense. What does the salt mean? If you've ever gone to a restaurant and they bring your meal out, and you're like, whoa, could I, I don't know what happened back there, but could I get, can I get some salt? Because you can tell when salt's missing. Or, hey, real quick, can you guys come back? Can we swap this out? What happened? I don't know. Somebody was heavy-handed back there. It's way too much salt. Yeah. That's wild that one can be completely void and missing. It's the same ingredient, and one can be too much. Why? Because it's distinctive. Wow. Yeah. Salt is distinctive. Yeah. We were never designed as children of God to blend in. Yeah. I remember there was these horses. We were living in Michigan. Uh, our first two were born in Michigan, and we were driving and there was this guy who had all this land and there were these wild horses just running out of it. It was beautiful. I mean, it was like slow motion. Like I, I swear Chariots of Fire was playing like doom, 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 doom. Like these horses were like, I was like, look at this. Like it was beautiful. But then there was this other horse out there running and I said, what is happening? What is that? And my wife's like, that's a zebra. But he was running along and flipping his head and acting just like the horses. And no matter how much he tried to blend in, he couldn't. Because of his stripes, everybody could tell that he was a zebra because he was distinctive. Say out loud, I'm distinctive. I'm I'm not called to blend in. Come on, type in the chat, I'm not called to blend in. My life is salt. Listen, God knows you. God chose you, God loves you. So when we think about that, what happens is we're like, okay, God knows me, check. He chose me, praise God, he loves me. But then our natural mind says, yeah, but what about my insecurities? What about my doubts? What about all my fears? Instead, we have to think about God's faithfulness. We have to think about God's goodness. We have to think about God's power. We have to think about God's love. Because again, we're all called to carry the good news. Why? Because number two, love is essential. Y'all, love is essential. And I'm not talking about the romantic love. Some of y'all are like, okay, now we're talking. No, no, we're, we're gonna deal with romantic love in September during our relationship series. I'm talking about agape love, the God kind of love. And some of y'all are like, well, that's easy to say that we have to love everybody, but what does that actually look like? Walking in love is an action. It's a choice to choose to look like Christ. Here's how Jesus describes it in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. So I'm giving a new commandment to you now. Love each other just as much as I love you. Ooh, that's sobering. Your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31 says, and you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, And the second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Our love for God and our love from God requires and should compel us to love our neighbor. It's difficult to love others when you haven't first received that love yourself. Because you can't take people to a place that you aren't yourself. It's difficult to love someone else when you're empty yourself. 
That's why it's so important. We've preached this for a long time. You've heard this quote. You've probably seen it. You probably even copy and pasted it from somebody. It's important to heal from what hurt you so you don't bleed on other people that didn't cut you. Because watch this. An unhealed hurt often becomes an unleashed hurt on somebody else. And they are a byproduct of your struggles and stuff that you've been dealing with. That's where the agape, unconditional love from our Heavenly Father begins to soften and heal even the hardest hearts and heal even the most broken places. Colossians chapter three, verse 17 says, and whatever you do or say, I love this translation in the New Living. It says, you do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Again, we're all called to go with the good news, to tell people about Jesus. Recognize that love is essential. I was leaving a, a, a conference or a concert. My buddy Todd Galbraith came into town and uh, Rodney, who's on our worship team, uh, man, such a good singer. Can we give that for Rodney and Hope City Worship? All of Hope City Worship, but Rodney was included in this. So we were uh, at this concert and afterwards we're like, all right, man, good to see you, good to see you. All right, okay, cool. So I leave, and I'm driving on 45, and right up in front of me, uh, this truck cuts this lady off and slams into the side of her SUV, and she plows into the center median and starts spinning around. I mean, smoke's going everywhere. People are slamming on their brakes, going around, and just going, 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 going. So I roll up on this accident. All the airbags have blown. You could see it. The car is mangled, and as I'm driving by, I... I the only way I can describe this is I just felt this nudge from the Lord that said, if not you, then who? So I pull up in my truck, and this is a little bit of a dangerous situation, and I understand that, and I'm not disregarding that, but I felt the Holy Spirit say, I I've got you. So I go up to the car, and I peel back the, the, the wind curtain, the side curtain of, of the uh, airbag, and there's this lady about six years old, and she's crying, and she's, She's discombobulated, she's freaking out. She's like, where's my grandbabies? Where's my grandbabies? And I'm looking in the car, and there's a little girl in the back seat, and even a littler girl in the, in the second seat, and then the passenger seat was another. All her grandbabies were with her. And so, I, I don't know what it was. Y'all, the only time I run is if I'm being chased. The only time I work out is if Jackie threatens me and says, you better work out. So anyways, I pried this door open that should have been the strength of multiple men. It was a team lift effort, but it was me and my guardian angel. Come on. I don't know. But anyways, I got the door open. I was able to uh, help get, get them out of the car. The little girl, the, the four-year-old jumps in my arms. I, I help the nine-year-old out, the 11-year-old, and we're standing off to the side, and she's saying, you're my guardian angel. You're my guardian angel. And we got them off to the side, and I was moved with compassion because when you walk with Jesus, the foundation of love is essential. Another car pulls up. She's a nurse, and she said, I didn't feel comfortable stopping, but when I saw your big truck pull up, and I saw you getting them out of the car, and I saw you over here praying for them, I had to come over. So we all start praying. And I said, where were y'all? And they were like, we were at this church service. I said, my God, so was I. <laughs> like, this is crazy. <laughs> I stood there because I was moved by compassion. Are you moved by compassion? Now, I know this situation was a little bit extreme, but when you see people who are in wrecks and chaos and their life is in ruins, I'm not talking about maybe a physical wreck, but maybe their marriage. Maybe their kids have gotten caught up in the prodigal life. Maybe you see someone that's falling off the rails and you're just turning a blind eye to it because if I get involved, it'll cost me too much of my time. And the Lord's saying, Will you move with compassion? Will you show them who I am as my hands and feet on the earth? So again, we're all called to tell people about Jesus. Because number three, God's church is unstoppable. When we do all of these things and they are united together and we recognize that we are called to go with the good news, we recognize that love from God is essential. Y'all, God's church is unstoppable because a church united is what the enemy is terrified of. Amen. We see a church that's strong. We see a church that's full of faith here called Hope City, 
a church full of expectation for miracles and signs and wonders. We believe God with audacious faith, with breakthrough. Come on, if you believe it, shout amen. amen. So here's the last verse. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verses four through six, because we are the body of Christ. We make up the body. Some of y'all are like the strange little pinky toe, but we're still the body, amen. <laughs> says this, in the way we are like the various parts of a human body, each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. That's you, say that's me. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts of Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we're made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other, trying to be something we aren't. Because again, we know, we've been talking about this all weekend today, that God has an incredible plan for your life. Yeah, but I hear you, Daniel, but everyone else seems to have it figured out other than me. I'm not that gifted. I need somebody to hear this. You won't be distracted by comparison if you are captivated by purpose. You won't be caught up with comparison of what she does better, he does better, what they do better. Instead, you're like, I'm captivated by purpose. God, if you're gonna move in my city, if you're gonna move in my job, if you're gonna move in my neighborhood, don't overlook me, because here's my yes. Because again, God never wanted perfect. He just wants our hearts. He wants our yes. So here's our summer challenge. Call to go with the good news. Tell people about Jesus. To recognize that Christ's love is essential. To recognize also that we all have a mission to help build God's incredible church. Would you close your eyes for just a moment? God, I know there are people watching right now in this room that are struggling with the go, the go part, because maybe they've been hurt, maybe they have church hurt, maybe they've been frustrated. Maybe the storms in life have overwhelmed them to the point where it has robbed them of their courage, their perseverance, their drive and fight. Step into the call and the assignment that you have for them. So God, here's our commitment to you today for week one of our summer sessions, God, is we will commit to live open-handed, and we will commit to get our yes out of the way every day. God, we ask that you would use our lives as willing vessels. We're going to commit to go with the good news. We're going to commit to get in the way of other storms and point them to you because we recognize that your unconditional agape love is essential. And we recognize that the church is not about a building, it's about the body. And we're all a part of this beautiful body. We wanna represent your heart well, and we wanna help build your church because it is unstoppable. Church unified is what the enemy is terrified of. So God, move in our city, move in the cities that are watching from around our beautiful nation and world. And God, in the midst of all the noise and chaos and uncertainty and financial issues and crisis and all the things that we're dealing with in the day to day, get our attention, God. Wake us up in the middle of our slumber and our sleep and speak life into us. Give us audacious faith and boldness, recognizing who we are because of who you are. With every eye closed just for a moment, whether you're here at West Houston or one of our campuses, you're watching online, you would say, Daniel, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to. I haven't been walking with him, but I want to. I came across this sermon today, and I don't know him as my savior, but I want to. The Bible says in Romans 10, verses nine and 10, that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved, set free, healed, restored, and delivered. Or maybe you're the second invitation. You're watching online, look at me real quick. Maybe you've fallen away from God. Maybe you've been living reckless. Maybe you got caught up in the prodigal life and you've been going away from the call instead of running to the arms of God. He's getting your attention today on purpose. This is an incredible assignment on your life. That marriage issue, that situation, that struggle, that diagnosis, 
in the hands of a savior, in the hands of our God, in the hands of Jesus, our healer, everything can change. He wants to write victory in your story again today. You can come back to his arms today. Whether you're the first invitation, you wanna give your life to Jesus for the first time, or you're the second, you wanna rededicate your life, I want everybody to pray this prayer. Everybody watching online, everybody at all of our locations, say this out loud. Jesus, it's me. Today, I surrender everything. All my shame, all my sin, all my bad choices, I give it to you. Thank you for forgiving me. You hung on a cross. I didn't deserve it. I should be paying the tab. But you did it because you love me. Call me by name. You said that I was valuable. From this moment on, I'm choosing to serve you wholeheartedly. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise? 